Good evening, everyone. I'm Bandhu Kurupu, Technical Events Coordinator for Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. And today is the 10th session of our lecture series on structural design of highway bridges. And we appreciate Professor Jaisinghat's willingness to share his expertise with us and his commitment to advancing the field of structural engineering. On behalf of all the participants, I want to thank him for his time, effort, and generosity in conducting this lecture series. And uh, for the participants, uh, kindly uh, add your membership number as well with your login name so that I use it and trace your participation. Uh, over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, so today uh, we are going to start a uh, new topic, uh, which is actually uh, applicable to Sri Lanka because uh, we have few bridges uh, that have been constructed as continuous. And uh, most of these designs have been done by, done in other countries. So uh, very little expertise is available in Sri Lanka at the moment uh, with the practicing engineer. So I thought uh, uh, of actually sharing uh, my expertise with you so that uh, you will be able to handle continuous bridges with confidence. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to discuss today is why continuous bridges cannot be constructed uh, in the normal, uh, sorry, they can be constructed, but you know why they cannot be designed in the normal way and what are the special things that we have to consider. So what I'm going to show you is that we'll uh, start handling the problem in the normal way and then we'll see what, where things can go wrong and how to address those special issues. So basically I will explain all the things on the understanding that it is going to work the normal method of designing a pre concrete bridge will work for continuous bridges as well. And in doing so, I will show you why it will not work. And then we will start discussing the special things. So uh, I might need one or two lectures first in the normal way. And after that, another lecture also to uh, uh, you know explain the way that we are going to handle the special issues. So uh, I'm going to go very slowly so that uh, you will be able to understand most of the special uh, features uh, and uh, concepts that we have to understand with respect to the uh, continuous media. So what I thought was I'll do a little bit of compar comparison when I'm uh, talking about it so that uh, you will be able to see where the design of simply supported and continuous would be similar, where it differs. And so with that, uh, I will now get the camera working so that I can uh, draw and explain. So we say, uh, Structural design of 
continuous pre stressed concrete bridges so we we'll see we we'll try to first understand the special features of a continuous construction and we we'll assume that you know one way or the other we can construct it at once later we see how we handle the issue that you know we cannot construct it at once so that will come later right so let's say that we have three span bridge continuous <coughs> so i would have to say that you know in sri lanka you would have seen some of the bridges where we use precast elements and uh, so these are how all our expressways are constructed uh, elevated expressways are constructed then we arrange the topping and here we apply a prestress like that now this is not the type i am going to talk here this is the real prestress concrete bridge type like uh, the six lane uh, new bridge at kalin river or uh, banabitiya bridge uh, the old uh, the bridge uh, close to uh, uh, the demo company uh, so that is the old uh, steel bridge that was replaced by two bridges they are all that type and uh, so let's say that you know we are going to have a two lane bridge then what we generally do is we'll have a large box girder supported like this and we'll have the pedestrian walkway here and the uh, the 3.5 meter carriage way here and we might have a handrail here handrail here and we can have another bridge side by side and here again or there is a possibility and here to remove make the weight minimum we remove the concrete in the center so we get uh, box girders and similarly we can also have t type builders t we can have two t's now that's another possibility this is another possibility but uh, this is more uh, common or more popular these days because we can uh, we have people have mastered various things so uh, when we have a box girder like this again there are certain uh, guidelines that we can follow and uh, first we'll uh, discuss briefly about some of those guidelines then then you'll have a good idea of uh, what we are trying to analyze so basically if you have a box girder one thing is you know you will have the top girder uh, like that and then it will go like that on like that and then you will have something going there like that and there will be a chamfer and you will get a section so generally the depth is selected so that you know you will have something like 1.8 meters to 2 meters generally but uh, we have actually constructed uh, box girders smaller than that the reason is uh, you know a person can walk inside uh, without much difficulty so that's one of the uh, one of the criterion that was used in the early days so which means uh, the span span or depth ratio will be something like uh, 22 26 page might be a possibility right and then uh, 
Then uh, there's another important thing that is, you know, the bottom flap has to be at least 175 millimeters. Because if the bottom flap is uh, thinner than that, it is uh, not uh, practically possible to uh, prevent cracking because, uh, you know, if the bottom flap is very thin, there's a tendency for some cracks to occur because uh, when you provide two mats of reinforcement, the reinforcement becomes too close. So when you have 175 millimeters, it can have sufficient flexural strength. Then you will ask why we need a chamfer. The chamfer is to make sure that the torsional shear flows like this around the section, around the section. Then you will ask how you get the torsion. And here you can see we are supporting it here. And this pedestrian pavement is uh, loaded less. So, uh, so we might get a situation where we have a heavy vehicle here and very little load here. So definitely this will be subjected to some certain amount of torsion. So if there is subjected to torsion like this, if it is subjected to torsion, uh, then uh, we need a torsional resistance. But one of the good things about these fine beads is that they are torsionally very rigid. The reason is when you look at the lever arm between the torsional stressors, uh, induced forces, there's a huge lever arm. So even uh, so, because of that huge lever arm, uh, you will find the torsional stresses are pretty small. And the torsional stresses will not go in these directions because torsional stresses will always go in a close path as much as possible. Then, uh, then we have to think, okay, what are we going to do here? For the top slab. Now the top slab, you know, the thickness can be something like 250 to 300 millimeters. Why? The reason is, you know, here we have chamfers and here we have a cantilever. So uh, we'll have to provide some reinforcement here and ensure that this cantilever is, can carry the load of a heavy load. Should be able to carry a heavy load because there can be a pedestrian movement here and it should be able to carry a heavy load. So uh, we might get some HB wheels on, the, on this. So we have to make sure, you know, the loading like uh, uh, one HB axle is about, if you are designing for 45 units, the one HB axle is 45 tons. So once you divide by four, you will get uh, 11.25 tons. So you get a heavy, very heavy load acting on the cantilever portion. So to, to resist that type of uh, moments, you might need 300 to 350 millimeters at the at this place. Here it can be less. It can be uh, 250. But here you need 300 to 350 uh, to resist a heavy load like that. But uh, certainly you know you can try smaller depths, provided that you are going to apply a little bit of force tension in the transverse direction. So that is uh, one possibility. And then how about this? Now, now we know if you are going for internal tendons, then we will have ducts in all these locations. So we have to make sure the duct uh, can be uh, accommodated. And then in addition to the duct, you have to ensure that this poker vibrator can go through it. So, so when you look at all those things in requirements, the minimum thickness of the web can might be about 300 to 350 millimeters. So this web can be uh, 300 to 350 millimeters. If you are going to anchor some of the tendons, uh, start the tendons or stop the tendons by having blisters. So blister is something that you have the wall like this. So you want to stop a cable. So you take it out and create a blister where you provide a lot of reinforcement like this, and the cable is anchored here. So that's a blister. So by creating blisters, we can anchor the reinforcement out. But the modern trend is to go for external blisters. So, so we might have some, some pre-stressing 
attendance outside the beam. So inside the beam, but outside the bed, outside the bed. So uh, depending on all those requirements, we might need 52, uh, 52, 75 millimeter adjustment in these uh, numbers. So, uh, but uh, general, generally these numbers will remain something like 300, 350, the bottom slab of 175, the top slab of about 250, and uh, the cantilevers, uh, the, the connecting point might be about 300, 350. So that will all can be optimized by when you analyze. But the most important thing is to find the cables, how we are going to lay the cable in the case of, uh, how we are going to lay the cables in the case of a uh, uh, continuous pitch, continuous pitch. So uh, this is the kind of section you get. And uh, let's assume that uh, we are going to construct it at once. So if we construct it at once, what will happen? We'll get a bending moment diagram due to due to the self fate of the structure. Due to the self fate of the structure, we'll get a bending moment. And we call it MD due to the dead weight. Now what are we going to do? What's, what's going to happen? Now we have to think about how a continuous bit respond uh, to the light, to the light. Uh, but if you compare a simply supported case due to self weight, what do we get? We get WS card on eight. Here it's much lower. Here you might get something like uh, WS card of eleven. Much lower value. Now you can clearly see why the continuity is uh, considered advantages. Because the moment you make it continuous, what happens is the bending moments reduce significantly because now a part of the bending moment is resisted with a hogging uh, with a with a hogging moment here, sagging moment here. So so when you look at the total range, the total range will be about W S card of eight. The range will be a double s card of eight. The design moment will be double s card of eleven. Whereas in the case of simply supported case, uh, we always get double s card of eight. Whereas in the continuous bit, the range will be in the range of double s card of eight, not the moment. So you can see uh, there will be a clear reduction in the bending moment that you have to use for design purposes, so which means the continuity will have a very distinct advantage uh, in uh, pre-stress concrete because or any other structure, continuity is always advantageous. So uh, today is ninth. And civil engineering sectional committee, page number one. Right, now we see what, what's going to happen with respect to the superimposed dead loads and live loads. Right. Superimposed dead loads. Let's assume that superimposed dead loads are also going to apply at once. So if they are also going to apply at once, later I'll show you uh, how we do the construction, but for the time being, we are going to assume that it, it, all these loads will come at once. So what will happen? You get up any moment diagram like this. Then the live load. Again, I will use uh, uh, the earlier BS uh, loads just to uh, make make things clearer for you. Then once you understand one type of loading, you can always use any other type of loading. So uh, what I do is I will uh, get uh, right. So this is the I'll use this old uh, BS uh, five four zero zero 
So in the case of a continuous beam, you are now going to get a sagging moment at the support. Sagging moment at the support. And you know, this can be reversed now. That is 26.18, 40 meters. Now all these ones, uh, the continuous, continuously applied uh, rotted length is 40 meters. Now what happens? Now you get a bending moment diagram that does this. Now, what are other possibilities? Other possibilities, only this one, that is 50 meters, and uh, 1050 to the power 0.475 multiplied by 151. That is just uh, 23.5. Lower than. Why? The loaded length is 50 meters. Now you can see, I mean, these days we have computers to do all these things. Now just imagine, you know, you are doing manual calculations and you get all the different types of loading. Really? Then the life would have been very difficult for high engineers. So now you can see a very different map. What is that? There's a saggy, hoggy moments in the span. So that is uh, now uh, with all these uh, different diagrams uh, with us, we just see what would the what would be the shape of the embryo. So we have this. So this situation. Now what would be the embryo? Embryo will look like this, going like this. Going up, going like this, going up, going like this. And then it will go like this. And then again, you can see. That will be the live load. Live load. Live load anyway. Can you understand? Now there are two important things we are learning. One is uh, we can be so many different load combinations, load, load, load patterns. And for each pattern, then the magnitude is different. For each pattern, the magnitude is different. And not only the magnitude, even the bending moment diagram is weird because some, some places, you know, generally we know at the support, the bending moment is hoggy. But here you have it is saggy. And then, then we also know in the span, bending moments are saggy. But here you are getting hoggy in the span. So because of this reason, if you put all these together, we get a very strange diagram that looks like this. Banduga, is that correct? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Clear. Now, yeah. now, now we'll uh, forget, uh, forget about uh, all this superimposed load just for clarity. And uh, now we have two, two loading conditions. One is uh, let's assume we have uh, superimposed dead load, dead load all put together. So we have we have one dead load, right? So that will take a shape like this. And then on top of that, we have a superimposed. Then again, you have to look at the kind of uh, magnitude of the bending moments. And you find now in a continuous structure, the, because we are using a massive section, uh, this dead load is also significant. Goes like that. Many more diagram goes like this. So, this is a dead load. 
Now we are going to know the uh, end norms. Now what will happen? Generally, if you, see, if you have only this part, what is visible, then the bending moment will be on the lower side. But now what we have is not a not one path, you have a system. So which means the bending moment diagram will go like this. And on the other side, it will go like this. To go like that. Then you might ask, so how are we going to uh, identify this? We we'll call this M B. We we'll call this M A. So M B is maximum moment. M A minimum moment. Okay. M A is maximum moment at least. Then you might ask, okay, what is the range? This is the range. You say delta m. What is delta m? This. Delta m is that. The range. Range is uh, that. So you can see something uh, very different. Now in the case of simply support, when you look at simply support case, the beam will bend like this at trans. Trans it will bend like this. It will bend like this in service. So when you look at the stressors, uh, trans is important. When you look at the stresses, trans is important. Why? Because uh, compression uh, at the bottom can be too much and it can fail. Or it can fail in tension. It can crack in tension okay. at the top. So it's tension here compression. Then we put it and we do apply the live load. When you apply the live load, so it, it tries to fail in the other way. So that's why we said, uh, you know, these three stress concrete bridges, if you go for composite construction, they have a massive capacity. Because now you can see it has a big top flange and uh, it also has strong tendons, so it's good. So, so we said transfer important. Now what you can see here? <clears throat> here you can see the bending moment diagram, minimum and maximum are not governed by the dead ground moment diagram. The minimum and maximum is governed by the range of the moment that you can get due to life. So the range of the moment is important and uh, trans is not important. Not the transfer represents the dead load moment diagram. Then, uh, then if live load is important, uh, we have to look at what is the pre stress imposed that is important. If trans is important, the initial pre stress force is important. So, here under service, R times P is not the initial pre stress after all the losses have occurred. The pre stress available will be R times P, where R is about 0.7 or 30 percent losses. So, what you get now is for one of the important conditions, P is important. For the other condition, RP is important. <clears throat> so, just keep it in mind. But here, trans is not important. So, minimum moment is also governed by RP. Maximum moment is also governed by RP. 
which means uh, you know we have very special condition. We have very special condition. That is, the dead weight of the structure is not going to be very important because our design is not governed by the dead load magnitude, but it is actually governed by the the moment range. Moment range. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, is that clear? So this is something that is very important for us to understand. So that is the clear difference between uh, the precast uh, simply supported construction that we often use, uh, where because we, we can't uh, afford to have a shuttering system at the site because we are constructing these old waterways and waterways and all these roads. So we have we cannot afford to have a proper shuttering system. So what we do is we go for pre-cast construction and also have uh, easy to cast uh, uh, wider top targets. So you will find that, uh, you know, uh, they cannot fail easy. Why? Because we have a very favorable, huge top plant. That's one, one side. On the other side, uh, you know, we have a very strong steel at the bottom because uh, the, the steel breaks only at 1860, whereas the steel is stressed only at about 920. So we can double it. That means, you know, there's a huge capacity in the pre stressing wire so that uh, with minimum amount of pre stressing wires, uh, you can actually. Uh, uh, satisfy the ultimate moment carry capacity requirements. There are two reasons. One is, you know, already the beam starts with some pre stress, like in the, like bending upwards. Then you keep on loading until uh, it uh, fails. And when you, when you are doing that, you find you know, you are actually loading a member, <coughs> which is having very favorable condition. So, because of that reason, we always say this is concrete beams generally do not uh, fail in ultimate limit state. And because of that, if you want, you can actually forget about ultimate, ultimate limit state and do all the designs um, considering the service conditions. Okay. So, we are going to use the same concept. But only difference is <coughs> because the structure is continuous. Now uh, the moment range is uh, governing, not the dead load moment. Whereas in the case of simply supported one, the trans was important. That means the initial uh, loading load applied is also important. Whereas uh, in this particular case, uh, we are going to see something strange happening, and that is. Uh, the moment range is governing, and for the moment range, always the pre stresses are times p. So, with this knowledge in our mind, and uh, assuming that you know we know the strand, we know the loading, and we can have a program like SAT 2000, and uh, because this, this, uh, our loading is more or less symmetrical. We can say I'm going to analyze the whole spine beam section as one beam and get the many moments. <coughs> you don't have to even go for a religion, right? Because uh, sometimes longitudinal roads are dominating, and there's uh, there's only one member, so so you will find it's uh, it's uh, pretty easy for you to analyze only one beam. And then you may get the many more lines. But uh, later, we, I'll show you how we deviate. But uh, for the time being, we are going for a simplified model so that we can understand what is going on. What is going on? Right? Now, what we do is if this is the case, if it's so easy to get a belly moment envelope with uh, maximum value as MB, minimum value as MA. 
Now we should be able to design the section. We should be able to design the section. So let's see how we can design the section. To find design section, first we have to find the precessing force. And to find the precessing force, now we have to see whether this uh, manual diagram or what you, in general you call as manual diagram is applicable. So, so we have to just see what's going on. And our question is, is manual diagram applicable? If it is applicable, uh, we know straight away you can find the pre force. And the theory is a uh, magnal diagram is applicable, but in a very special way, not in a normal way. So now we are going to discuss this special way. So you can you understand up to this point. Panduka, any questions in the chat channel? Chat, uh, mm -hmm. no, 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 nothing on the chat. Yeah, up to now, and, no questions. Sorry, no, no, nothing on the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if it is all uh, clear, I can now go to the next step, the very important step, where I'm going to look at the uh, magnet. So shall I go to that step? Okay, sir. Right? So what you have to understand is uh, if you take any section, uh, finding the maximum moment at that section and minimum moment at that section, that section is not a big deal. You can just analyze it as a beam and uh, beam on SAP 2000 and apply the loads, relevant loads and get the, get the answer. Because you can see pedestrian movement loads are not going to dominate. Why? Pedestrian beam uh, bombers need not dominate because the magnitude is only five uh, kilonewtons per meter squared. It's a small load. So uh, what you can do is you can apply the full load on the pedestrian pavement. That is five kilonewtons per meter squared multiplied by one point five meter. If it is if you are, they are having a walkway of one point five meter, and then uh, as we have done here. Uh, we can find the effect of HA loading, that is the UDL, and then we combine them and apply. But when you're applying a UDL, uh, there are there's a, something called knife edge load. So if you are interested in finding the shear force, we bring the knife edge load close to the support. If you are interested in finding the maximum bending moment in a particular span, then uh, we place the knife edge load at the center of the span. But uh, on a particular loading, you can't have two knife edge loads. You can have only one knife edge load. So, uh, so if you take uh, this particular first case, you have to apply the knife edge load either here or here in the center or here to get the maximum uh, bending moment. You can't apply three, three knife edge loads. You can apply only one knife edge load and you have to decide where you are going to apply it. So in this case, uh, we cannot strictly say which one would be more critical. So we have to apply it at the center of 40 meter and center of 50 meter. But if you are interested in finding the maximum shear, then we bring the knife edge load as close as possible to the support. So that uh, on one side of the support, you get a, you get a massive load on the other side not. So automatically, the shear force diagram will be altered, right? So that's how we are looking at it. So, uh, so basically, uh, with this uh, with these numbers that I uh, these are actually very simplified numbers because we have ignored HA HA knife edge loading, and also we have ignored uh, HB type loading. But uh, to understand the theory, always we have to use a reasonably simple example. So because of that reason, I have simplified it as much as possible. Now we are going to look at uh, the uh, equations, governing equations and the manual diagram and see which theory is applicable. See which theory is applicable. Because we have already uh, derived uh, the set, uh, set of equations. And actually, we derived it for 
simply supported case, then we derived the same thing for content uh, composite action. Now today we are going to use the same set of equations for continuous construction. So what are the special conditions in our sign convention? We measure upwards y1 as negative. We measure downstairs y2 uh, downwards. We measure downwards positive. Z1 negative. Z2 positive. I value positive. I can I is second mode of area. It cannot have negative and positive. It's always positive. Right. Now we take the section again as earlier and apply a pre stressing force. And compression is positive. So you get POA. POA. And because the tendon is not at the center with an eccentricity, so this is compression. So we get uh, this is PE, uh, and here you get uh, going upwards, so you get uh, uh, compression here, tension here. So you get PE e over Z2, PE e over Z1. Here we want a negative answer, but Z1 is negative, so automatically we get a negative answer. Right? And then uh, due to the applied loads, this is going to fail in tension in, uh, in the mid span. So what, what happens? Then you get the The moment, and if you look at the moment, right, it is uh, it is one of these moments. The range, one of these moments, one of these moments. and when you apply the maximum uh, moment, uh, what can happen? If you apply the maximum moment in the span, what could happen? If you apply the maximum moment in the span. Here you can see we are applying a certain moment. So we get a situation where MB over Z2 minus. Here you get MB over Z1 minus. So we'll uh, write two equations for this case. We'll write two equations for this case. Uh, so uh, we we'll get we we'll get uh, the, for the top fiber P O A plus P E over Z one minus N B over Z one. And what could happen? Uh, this is going to fail in uh, compression. Because uh, when you apply this second moment, when you apply this second moment, this MB is second moment, when you apply this second moment, what will happen? When you apply this second moment, what happens is, uh, you know, you will get the beam failing with tension at the bottom. Beam failing with tension at the bottom, compression at the top. So that's what I have done. Tension at the bottom, compression at the top. So, so, so it's going to fail in. So, uh, it's going to fail in tension. So here you get a. Sorry, you yeah, the top fiber, so it's going to fail in compression. So it's going to fail in compression. So if that is the case, it should be less than compression. Underworking conditions. 
So that is first. Now you look at the bottom fiber. How is going to fade in tension? The bottom fiber is going to fade in tension. So P over A plus P over Z2 minus MA or Z2 should be greater than tension at number two. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, sir. So, and there's one question regarding Sorry. bending is moment analysis. Yeah, yeah. What is that? Uh, in oh, the there's a, there's a, on the chat, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. He's relating to bending moment analysis at different stages. The natural analyze 50 and... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Now, I did not do that, but you know, now, now that's, there can be many other cases. So, so that's that's the problem with this bridge design. So, so this is also a possibility. This is a possibility. The 50 plus and uh, 40 is 90. So, 90 means uh, 1 divided by 90 to the power 0.475. Multiplied by 151. So you get 17.81. Now the loading is 17.81. What is the shape of the bending moment? Going to be like that, going to be like that, and going to be like that. So you get so many different combinations. So that's where the problem comes. When it is continuous, numerous number of possible combinations. Not only that, I mean, you can even have half the span loaded. So there are so many different combinations, but generally, uh, this type of combinations will be more uh, critical. So you can, and not only this, now you can get a mirror image of this also. So you will get about 15, 20 load combinations with different lengths, different magnitudes. And very strange type of bending moment analysis. I'm sure, I mean, you, you are not very familiar with this type of bending moment analysis. Or this type of bending moment analysis. So we are getting so many different types of bending moment analysis. And that's where the bridge engineers uh, struggled a lot in the early days because uh, they had to do manual calculations. So they struggled a lot. Right. So at here, we are having a much uh, favorable condition because uh, now we have computers. Now we have computers. So it's a matter of uh, creating a structure and then creating different load phases with different materials. Computer will do the rest. And not only that, uh, computer will even generate the end load because we can ask the computer to uh, create either a bending moment diagram or an end load. So all those facilities are there. So with those facilities, the life, uh, the, the, the calculations that you have to perform have become much simplified. Now you concentrate more on the design than analysis because analysis can be handled straight away by the, by the um, uh, computer. Whereas uh, design part is the one that you have to uh, be really careful before you go for any kind of preparation for fresh right. Now, now you look at this part. That is uh, this one, the minimum value, MB case, right? The minimum value. So what happens in the minimum value? Now it's like, you know, if you look at the minimum value here, what will happen? It is like uh, the, the case uh, that we got here, the beam bending upwards, beam bending upwards, right? So, so we have to uh, find a, situ a case for that, right? So uh, this is the case, right? But uh, what we do is, you know, we are actually checking for a particular moment. And uh, so only thing is, 
Now it's going to fail in the other direction. It's going to fail in the other direction. So what happens now is again you get the same equation T over A plus T E over Z1 minus M B M A over Z1. Now what's going to happen? Now it's not going to fail in compression. It's going in other direction. So it's going to fail in tension. F T W. So this is equation number three. Then you get another equation P over A plus P E over Z2 minus M B over Z2. M A over Z2. Should be, now this is uh, the bottom fiber uh, failing in compression. So because uh, we, are, we are talking about a minimum. So it has to be less than F compression. Now we get, uh, again, we are getting four equations. And if you look at this equation, again, you cannot say P, all these values will be R. Why? Because we are dealing with a situation where we are, we are, cons we are considering a bridge in use, in use. So we will all get R. Because we are considering a bridge that is in use. So uh, there can be two types of failures. One is this type of failure. The other one is this. So we first consider this failure. Now we are considering this particular failure. This will occur when the bending moment is maximum. This will occur when the bending moment is minimum. When the bending moment is minimum. So that's how you are looking at it. Right? That's how you are looking at it. So we get four So I think it is muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, now you see, uh, you know, if, so you can write this equation from this first equation, and then uh, we because uh, E is uh, negative, Z one is negative, so we get the inutility in the other direction. So here you get uh, minus Z one away plus. Uh, FCW Z1 plus MB divided by RP. So this will be equation number 5. And from the next equation also you get E should be greater than minus Z2 of A plus FTW Z2 plus MB RP. Equation number six. Then equation number seven will be P should be less than minus Z1 over A plus FTW Z1 plus MA or RP. And the last equation B should be less than minus Z1 over A plus FCW Z1 Z2 plus MA divided by R8. So we have eight equations like that. So same pattern like we, we have seen earlier, uh, the same pattern. Z1, Z2, Z1, Z2, and Z1, Z2, Z1, Z2. Here in B, here in B. Right? Very, very simple pattern. Same pattern, same inequality. Same, same, everything is similar. 
So that is y greater than c plus m x. What is m? One of m is one of p. What is x? That is uh, f c w set one plus m d over. R. What is c? Is said over a. It should be one. Is it one over a or is it two? Over? So we get a equation like that. Which means again we can go for the graphical representation. We can again go for the graphical representation. Section of committee number five, and today is ten five twenty twenty. Now we will find now uh, this uh, this beam this uh, continuous beam design to be extremely simple. Why? Because uh, you know the the simple theory that we uh, learned in the form of a graphical representation is applicable for continuous construction, and uh, the, the equations are even simpler than uh, what we got uh, with uh, simplicity simple case. Because when you say this about case, uh, in one equation, the pre stressing force is T. In the other condition that is under service, it's R T. R plus S. But here, everything is R T. So then we can find so many interesting things from this set of things. There are many, many interesting things you can find about it, about the, man about the manual diagram. So we are going to look at those. So what happens? So we get one OP, and here we are going to get uh, E, and he uh, said one OA minus he said one OA minus he said two over A. Why? C means minus he said one OA or he said two OA. C. As a intercept. Yeah. So equation number five says E should be greater than. And uh, equation last equation say E should be less than. Is that right? E should be greater than. The other two says E should be less than. It should be less than yes. Now what we do is equation number five and six says it should be greater than. Okay, so that means it says it should be equation number five, the equation number six. And then uh, we have two more equations which says it should be less than. And that means it should be less than. Number seven should be less than. And it should be less than. Eight. Now we have an additional limit on the eccentricity we cannot have the tenders outside the section so this e max so what is the feasible region like that we get a feasible region like that and for this to exist is to exist. Uh, gradient of eight should be greater than gradient of six. Gradient of eight should be greater than gradient of six. For this condition to happen, gradient of eight should be greater than gradient of six. Because uh, six and seven says E should be greater than. E should be greater than. E should be greater than means 
e should be on this side. And the last two equations say e should be less than. That means e should be on the upper side. So if you take the gradient of 8, that is fcw set to plus ma over p over should be greater than ftw is set to plus mb or and then we can say is set two times fcw minus ftw should be greater than in b minus ma and is set two should be greater than in b minus ma minus ma divided by fcw minus ftw can you see fcw is positive ftw is negative this is a positive quantity mb minus ma is again a positive quantity so if you look at the menu moment diagram that we have drawn this mb minus ma mb is say 18,000. MA is 10,000. MB minus MA is 8,000. Right? So, uh, so you get this equation. He said 2 should be greater than MB minus MA, which is the range of moment. And how do we get the range of the moment? We get the range of the moment from the bending moment it is. This is the range of the moment. The range, same range here. Same range here, same range here. So basically the low load uh, bending moment end block will decide the range. The low load bending moment end block will decide the range. And here you can see the section required is uh, does not depend on the dead load, but it rather depends on the range of the moment. Range of the moment. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? right? Okay. So, uh, so basically, uh, now we get this equation. Now we can also look at the next equation. Uh, that is uh, gradient of gradient of uh, seven should be greater than gradient of five. Gradient of seven should be greater than gradient of five. So here what I'm saying is this and this. Gradient of 7 should be greater than your gradient of 5. So we look at it. Gradient of 7. FTW FTW is at 1 plus MA divided by R Gradient of 7 should be greater than gradient of Z1 plus MB or and you take Z1 times FTW minus FCW should be greater than MB minus MA. So Z1 should be greater than MB. Uh, should be less than why this ftw minus fcw is negative so it should be fb minus so we said one should be less than mb minus ma divided by uh, ftw minus fcw so just see the this compare these two equations MB minus MB, FCW minus FTW, here FTW minus FC. So what it means is, it's saying uh, Z2 is positive. Because of, its, because of that reason, it's given by MB over MA minus FCW minus FTW. He said one is negative. 
So it is given by M B minus M A over F T W minus F C W. So same, same thing. Get the same answer. The same answer. That means the moment we find the line load range, the line load range, the range for the line load, that is uh, this. Uh, after doing all these different load combinations, uh, you can go for an end load. The moment you draw the end load, we know the range. So this, this M B minus M A range. So the range is known. For this number five, this number six, right? This number seven. So, which means get the envelope, get FCW. And FTW when you say that you get the range of that means you know MB minus M A. You straight away know what is Z1? Was it Z2? So what I don't do, you know the range, select a section like this. Like this, calculate Z1, Z2, is negative, is positive. Compare these two ends. Straight away, you know whether the section is going to work or not. Straight away, you know whether the section is going to work or not. So you have to select a section where Z1 and Z2 values are as required according to the Bending moment range. Is that clear on the board? Is that clear? Yes, sir. So it is clear. I mean, I gave a chart to find the section for uh, Y beams. Yes, sir. So, so even if a person is not a bridge engineer, straight away he can say what is the what is the what is the bridge that will work work for a given span. Right, but we don't have any chart like that for box girders. So what are we going to do? What we will do is uh, we we will not worry about the section. We will develop a bending moment diagram under elastic conditions, and from the bending moment diagrams we can get the envelope. From the envelope we can get the range, and once you know the range. Straight away we know in which uh, what is the minimum size needed. What is the minimum size needed? So we select a section which is larger than that. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, so basically we don't need a chart like that because uh, because you know we can't uh, anybody nobody can draw charts for box girders because uh, everything is variable. And that will all depend on uh, practical considerations because we are not talking about very small members. We are talking about massive members over large spans. So the design engineer might do so many things to optimize it. Even the even this angle for the chamfer is not known. So that will all be decided by the design engineer. So so basically nobody can uh, develop any chance for box curves. But uh, we don't know need it. Why? The the moment you draw the bending moment diagram, just having an arbitrary view, and get the bending moment diagram, and then from those get the bending moment and you know, find the range. And the moment you find the range, you can get Z1 and Z2. So select a section which is having Z1 and Z2 larger than what is given by these two. So that's what you do. 
Is that clear? Yes, sir. That's fine. That's good. Then there are some other interesting things uh, we can see from this. Uh, uh, if I look at, uh, uh, so this is the, you can see this is the minimum moment. This is the intersection of equation numbers 5 and 8. And this is equation, the intersection of equation numbers 7 and 8. And then, uh, then if you look at the intersection of uh, 5 and 6, and seven and eight, five and six, and seven and eight. We just uh, look at it and see what are these uh, pre-stressing values. That is the intersection of uh, uh, these two lines. These two lines. That is equation number five and six, and seven and eight. So let's see what are five and six. What are five and six? Phi and six, this is MB, and intersection means uh, the the extension is the same. So you can say minus is at one over a plus FCW is at one plus MB over RP is equal to equation number six. That's what happens in the intersection point. So that is minus is at two over a plus ftw is at two plus mb or so you find this mb or rp appears on both sides so it will cancel out and we have this rp so you get fcw set one CW is at one. Yes, FTW is at one uh, minus FTW is at two or RP is equal to minus is at two over A plus is at one over A. From this, you can work out the equation for RP is equal to. This goes this way, this goes this way. If CW is at one minus if TW is at two, divided by minus is at two over A plus is at one over A. From this one, P is equal to So you can take uh, divide both top and bottom by minus one. Mm. Then you get uh, yes, okay, doesn't matter. FCW is at one minus FTW is at two divided multiplied by A divided by R. You get minus is at one minus is at two. So this is negative, this is negative, this is also negative. So that means you get a positive answer. And uh, let's say this point is A, this point is uh, point A, this point is point B. So the corresponding pre-stressing force is my 1 over P A. The corresponding precision for CI is 1 over PB. 1 over PA, 1 over PC. Right? So, so this is PA. What will you get for the PB? Same thing. And uh, PB will be uh, pretty similar. But now look, let's look at uh, what are the important things. Now, does this point depend on uh, section sizes or the bending moment? It doesn't depend on the bending moment. 
doesn't depend on the vending counter. So that means along the beam, this the the manual diagram will move like this in a narrow band. This P A and P B will be independent of the vending moment, whereas these points will be dependent on the vending moment. We call them uh, C and D. C and D will be dependent on the vending moment. Uh, A and B will be independent. So now you can see if you are selecting a pre-stressing force, in which region we should select it? We should select it in this region. Why? Because it, the pre-stressing force is as minimum as possible. Pre-stressing force is as minimum as possible. So you can see something very interesting. Something very interesting. That is, uh, you know, the the along the beam, magnetic diagram is going to move like that. Because this PA and PB are independent of the bending moment, but dependent only on the section. So PA and PB will depend on the section sizes, not on the bending moment. And uh, when you are designing, we always make sure we select a force that's as close as possible to the minimum. So those are the important things you can learn from uh, what I have explained today. And uh, it looks like the equations for, uh, for a continuous beam appear as uh, pretty much simpler than the simply, uh, the simply supported case because uh, in the simply supported case at transfer the pre-stress was P under service RP. So, so R term was can be seen in the in the equations. But here, you know, R term is uh, not very important and uh, it appears, but uh, for A, P, A and P, B, R term will come. And here you can see it depends on the allowable stresses and the section sizes, not based on the, it is not based on the bending point. So those are some of the pretty interesting things. So, uh, so what I have shown is that uh, magnetic diagram is a pretty strong uh, tool and it, it is applicable for simple support case, it's applicable for uh, composite section. Now it is, now you have seen it's applicable even for a continuous one. But, but you have to be a little careful uh, because uh, some of these things uh, would not appear as simple as this. Uh, and that's what people found it hard way. Although they thought, okay, so it's so simple. Later they found uh, it's a nightmare designing a continuous bridge. But uh, later, you know, uh, when I did the PhD, I developed a new method uh, that will allow us to find the design this in a very simple manner. So that's what I'm going to explain uh, next, in the next two weeks. The first I will explain why this simple method could not work. And then I will explain how to get it work. So that's how uh, we are going to develop the uh, lecture series. So there'll be uh, two or three more lectures, about four, four, three more lectures on a continuous bridge design and uh, once you understand this method again you will find it, uh, the design of a continuous bridge is not as simple as designing a simply supported one but once you master it if you can uh, within a reasonable time with the aid of a uh, spreadsheet we can easily complete a uh, continuous bridge design as well. So that's what I'm going to show you. Only thing is because we are dealing with so many uh, sections, it's very hard for us to do manual calculations for each and every section. Uh, so because of that reason, we, we, uh, we include all these equations in a spreadsheet and then uh, we use the spreadsheet for our calculations rather than doing manual calculations. So that's how pre-stress concrete bridges are designed these days. So, you know, you can easily prepare a spreadsheet in the way that you like. 
and then uh, get the computer to do all the calculations. But because you know the equation that you have used, you have the full control of the process. You have the full control of the process. So is that clear, one of them? Yes, sir. That's clear. Yeah, and one there's one, one question. Yeah. Uh, something related to uh, what is the meaning of uh, line of thrust? Line of thrust will come, but uh, we have not come to that level yet, right? So uh, in the third week or the, in, in two weeks time, I will explain what is line of thrust. Or sometimes even next week, I might explain it, right? The line of thrust is something that we have to very carefully understand. To understand what is line of thrust, first we have to understand what is meant by second moments or reactant moments. So I will introduce reactant moments uh, that will automatically occur in uh, continuous uh, structures and actually that is the problem that happens. So basically, uh, once you select the cable profile as for the manual diagram, after completing all the calculations, now you will find there are some additional moments that you have not considered in the design. So which means all your calculations will be invalid. So you complete the design to find that all your calculations are invalid. So that was the problem. And that is the problem I have solved by developing a new design method. And, uh, and when you use that method, you will not have that problem. But uh, I will explain what is line of thrust next week. OK? okay not only line of thrust, there are, there's something called concordant profile and uh, actual cable profile, line of thrust, concordant profile. There are so many new terms that you are going to learn. Is that okay? Okay, sir. That's fine. Right. Then we conclude here. But uh, so far, it's very good because uh, what we have done is uh, we have repeated what we have done earlier for simply supported and uh, composite sections. Yes. But when you do the same thing, you will find it's not going to work for continuous structures and you need a special design method. And I will explain it. With the aid of a spreadsheet, uh, I might need about three more days to do that. Okay. Okay, sir. Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so shall I conclude? Okay, that's fine, sir. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I would and like I will, to. I will, I will share this uh, notes with you. Okay. Sure, okay. sir. And I would like to invite uh, engineer Chamit Gaya to do the word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Mister. Uh, uh, thank you, Mister Bandugar. Uh, I am pleased to deliver this uh, vote of thanks for, for the session of the webinar series on the uh, success uh, on the structural design of highway which is conducted by Professor Chisan Jaisingna on behalf of the organizing committee. Uh, I would like to express our uh, heartfelt gratitude to Professor Chisan Jaisingna for the uh, insightful and informative presentation. The webinar series has been uh, Hello. Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear. Ah. Yes, we can hear you. The webinar series has been great uh, success, and we have received numerous positive feedback from the participant. This uh, would have been uh, possible without uh, the support of the CESC chairman, engineer, Mrs. Kamala Gunwardhan, the IACL secretary, the publicity department, and the ITT. Uh, we would like to thank them for their uh, dedication and the uh, hard working in making this event success. Uh, we would also like to express our appreciation to all the participants for their active uh, participation and the insightful questions. Your enthusiasm and the uh, engagement have made this uh, webinar series valuable learning experience for all. Finally, uh, we would like to inform you that the next session of the webinar series will be held on the 16th of May. Uh, we, uh, and we hope to see you all there. Uh, thank you. Good night to all. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You, I'll, I'll leave you there. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.